in case you get tired legs. Um, thank you all uh, for sparing the time uh, to come this morning. This is sort of, I think of uh, this as is the, is the US launch of the BP Statistical Review. We, we launched it in London yesterday. And I think the tradition and the, the, the appropriate tradition is that we then launch it the following day in, in Washington, DC. So it's, it's really nice. It's a real pleasure to be here. Although I had 25 years at the Bank of England, I had two years at the Federal Reserve. Uh, and so spent two years in Washington between 2006 and 2008. And I love coming back to Washington. So it's a real pleasure. Although I don't remember being this, being this hot in June um, when, I used to be, when I came. Um, I was here in February. Um, uh, as Guy said, we're presenting then BP's Energy Outlook 2035. So then the task was to look forward uh, 20 years. The task for today sort of is somewhat uh, more limited, which is, but I think even more fascinating, which is to look back a year using uh, the BP's uh, statistical review. As, as Guy said, I, I'm not from the, uh, the energy um, the mafia. I'm from central banking. And over the last year since since joining BP, I've really come to appreciate the sort of level of respect and trust the BP Stats Review is held in by, by, by governments, uh, by commentators, and I guess perhaps most importantly all by, by the energy industry. Um, for me, this was really brought home to me when I was having a conversation with Dan Jurgen. Now, you all know who Dan Jurgen is, you know, the author of the prize, surely the sort of the king of energy market analysts. And, and Dan said to me, you know, so I keep... I always keep two things in my briefcase, just in case. Uh, my passport and a copy of the BP Stats Review. And you think, well, look, hey, if it's good enough for Dan, then it's certainly uh, good enough uh, for me. So it's a real pleasure for me uh, to present uh, this, this year's review of 2014. And what a fantastic year uh, in terms of my first one to review, in, in terms of everything that was going on. The US, shower revolution, scaled new heights, oil prices uh, plummeted. Carbon emissions are estimated to have grown at one of their slowest rates for over 15 years. Um, in recent years, and, and some of you may still see my, my predecessor, Christoph Ruhl, um, present previous uh, energy outlooks. And, and Christoph spoke about the eerie calm that had befallen energy markets in sort of 2011 to 2013. The events of, of last year provide a, sp a stark remind reminder that in energy, after a calm, comes the storm. Uncertainty and volatility are the norm, not the exception in energy markets. The, the turbulent and unsettled conditions that characterised global energy markets in 2014 were driven by a whole range of factors, many of those factors specific to particular markets, particular fuels, particular countries. But there was also, I think, if you stand back a little bit, there was a number of broader, more encompassing forces which are acting across the, the whole world of, of energy, helping to shape that global energy landscape. And I would highlight um, three in particular. First uh, is, was the continuing shower revolution in the US. In China, 2014 was the year of the horse. In energy, I think 2014 was the year of the American eagle, as the US shale industry went from strength to strength. At its height last year, more than 1,800 rigs were operating in major US oil and gas plays, drilling around 40,000 new wells. Capital spending in the shale industry is estimated to have reached around $120 billion in 2014. That's more than double its value five years ago. And the increase in productivity was even more striking. And coming from a macro background, I think the increase in productivity seen in the shale industry are just mind-boggling, with productivity in tight oil plays increasing sevenfold since 2007. And the results of that were even more uh, startling. US oil production rose by 1.6 million barrels in 2014, by far the largest growth in the world, and the first time any country has increased its production by more than 1 million barrels a day for three consecutive years. As a result, US oil production in 2014 exceeded its previous peak level set in 1970. So I think that, that peak oil finally really does go um, in that sense. And perhaps most important of all, as shown here in this chart, the US, um, shown here in the green line, leapfrogged both Saudi Arabia and Russia to become the world's largest oil producer for the first time since 1975. US shale gas 
also continued to grow strongly, with US production accounting for nearly 80% of the total increase in global gas supplies in 2014. If you look back over the past 10 years, US shale gas has accounted for almost half of the total increase in global supplies of natural gas. The revised data in this year's review suggests that the US overtook Russia in 2013 to be the world's largest producer of oil and gas combined. So we are truly witnessing a changing of the guard in terms of global energy suppliers. The implications of the shale revolution for the US are profound. US net imports of oil in 2014 were less than half of their 2005 peak levels. The US is no longer the world's oil, largest oil importer. That dubious honor now belongs to China. In 2007, just prior to the financial crisis, the US was running a current account deficit of around 5% of GDP. And for those of you who think back to, to that period of time, that current account deficit was a, was a key part of the so-called um, global imbalances, which many economists think underpinned um, the financial crisis. Importantly, US energy imports accounted for almost half of that deficit. They're a major part of that. Just seven years later, in 2014, US energy imports comprised just 1% of GDP, and US production, shown here in the chart, accounted for almost 90% of its energy needs, a level not reached since the mid-80s. So profound effects for the US, and, and as we'll come on to see, the impact of US shale, the US shale revolution spread far beyond um, the lower 48. The second factor I would highlight driving global energy markets last year were developments in China. So if the American eagle soared in 2014, the Chinese horse quickened its pace of adjustment. Chinese GDP growth slowed to 7.4% in 2014, significantly weaker than the double-digit growth rates we'd become used to in the first 10 years or so of this century. This slowing was, was, was accompanied by, the, by a continuing shift in the pattern of growth. And it's that pattern of growth, which I think is really important here, with some parts of industrial production, and in particular real, est real estate investment, um, decelerating sharply. As a consequence, growth in some of China's most energy intensive sectors, so shown here, um, steel, iron, cement, these are sectors which had really thrived during China's rapid industrialization. Growth rates in those sectors virtually collapsed in 2014. You look at these growth rates here, these are growth rates around 1% or 2% for an economy which is growing 7 or 8 and which are, where these, these growth rates in the past had outstripped um, GDP. And they, they collapsed as more service-orientated parts of the economy came to the fore. This changing in the pattern of, of Chinese economic growth caused the growth of China's energy consumption, energy consumption to slow very sharply to just 2.6% in 2014. That's less than half its average over the past 10 years and the weakest rate of growth seen since the late 90s. Although the extent of the slowdown in Chinese energy growth to, to, to as low as 2.6 is, is, is striking, the implied reduction in energy intensity, i.e. sort of the amount of energy needed to produce each unit of GDP, shown here in the chart on the left, if you look at the, the most recent reading, although you see this, this step down, that degree, that reduction in energy intensity doesn't look um, extraordinary or without precedent. So, so in that sense, the data doesn't look um, particularly sort of odd in, in some sense. But even so, I think there are good reasons for thinking that this faster pace of energy reduction may not signal the beginning of a new trend. In, 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 in part, there must be a question of whether those exceptional low levels of growth reached in, the early, in those energy thirsty sectors like iron, steel and cement will be sustained, and, and suggesting there may be some sort of um, bounce back um, as, as growth rates in those, those sectors pick up. More generally, we might expect to see the rate of de decline in energy intensity in China, shown here in the chart uh, um, on the right here, that, that rate of energy intensity in China to start to de decline and taper off as it, as it converges on, on, on the rates seen in, in more advanced economies. So monitoring those developments will be a key task for future statist statistical reviews. For this year's review, the focus is on tracing out the implications 
of this sharp slowing in the growth of the world's largest energy market. The third factor, the overarching factor that I'd highlight, acting across the global energy landscape in 2014, was a continuing focus on climate and environmental issues. Climate concerns were an obvious focus in 2014 as global leaders and campaigners mapped their course um, to the Paris meetings at the end of this year. Considerable attention was also placed on broader environmental concerns with a number of significant regulatory announcements, including here in, in the US and, and, in, and in China. These policy initiatives, together with changing societal preferences and technological improvements, have, as I'll come on to show you, an important bearing on the fuel mix and the role of non-fossil fuels. The focus on climate and environmental issues also garners significant attention for developments in reserves of fossil fuels. Total proved reserves of fossil fuels were essentially unchanged last year, and the big picture remains one of abundant reserves, with new sources of energy being discovered more quickly they are consumed. For example, total proved reserves of oil and gas in 2014 were more than double their level in 1980 when our data begin. The issue is not whether we will run out of fossil fuels, but rather how we should use those ample reserves in an efficient and sustainable way. And when thinking about that challenge, I think it's important to remember that, that, that over one billion people on our planet don't currently have access to, electri to electricity. For those most affected regions, particularly in Africa and India, policymakers face the pressing need to improve the accessibility and the availability of energy necessary for the well-being of their citizens and, and for the strength of their economies. And that imperative in those regions will have an important bearing on, on uh, energy developments there. So the question is, if you like, so how did those three different forces, which I think were sort of sitting over the global um, energy markets in 2014, the strength of US shale, the rebalancing of China's economy, the continued focus on climate and environmental issues. How did those three factors play out last year across the global energy markets? If you stand back for a moment from the details of the particular gales affecting some markets or the dark clouds sitting over um, other fuels, the big overriding picture of 2014 was one of surprisingly weak growth in energy demand, coupled with greater resilience in production growth, and as a consequence, weakening in energy prices. Growth of primary energy consumption, shown here in this chart, slowed to just 0.9% last year, which, absent the financial crisis, is the slowest growth of energy demand since the late 90s. So this, is, so this is unusually weak growth in energy demand. As in much of the past decade, all of the increase in energy demand was from emerging economies, with energy consumption in the OECD continuing to fall. I spoke about some of that weakness in energy demand coming from China, but it wasn't res solely restricted to China. Energy consumption grew more slowly than recent averages in all regions, except North America, um, as, as we just discussed, and, and Africa, and, and with a particularly notable weakness in EU demand, which I'll come on to say. As you can see here, that sharp deceleration in energy demand wasn't a GDP story. Global GDP growth in, in 2014 grew at 3.3%, unchanged from what it was in 2013. So this is not a GDP-driven story. This is an energy intensity story, shown here by, by those green bars, where you saw this sharp fall um, in, in, in energy intensity. A significant part of that reduction can be related to one-off weather-related effects, particularly in the EU, and I'll come back to that. But over and above that was that impact um, from the rebalancing of the Chinese economy driving this, this improvements in energy intensity. In terms of the fuel mix, oil, uh, the green at the top here, was the fastest growing fossil fuel for the first time since 1997. Even so, oil still lost share within primary energy for the 15th consecutive year. Coal and gas also lost ground. The share of non-fossil fuels, shown at the bottom of this chart, 
reached an all-time high of almost 14%, with the shares of hydro, nuclear and renewables all increasing. On the supply side, energy production grew by 1.4% in 2014, so greater resilience on the supply side. That's a similar growth rate to 2013, although weaker than its 10-year average. The relative stability in aggregate supply growth masks significant differences across fuels, however, with a sharp acceleration in oil supply, offset by the first decline in coal production seen since the financial crisis in 1998. Although developing economies accounted for all the increase in energy demand, so I just, just to remind you, as I just said, all the increase in energy demand came from developing economies. However, on, in terms of supply growth, supply growth was dominated by the OECD, which accounted for over 80% of the increase in supply. So all of the demands coming from developing economies, 80% of the supply coming from the OECD. And you, as you can see here, over the past 10 years or so, the OECD, shown by the darker green line here, has had a significant improvement in its energy balance. So I'm using here sort of net exports of, of energy as a percentage of, of consumption. You can see this sort of improving energy balance of the OECD economies and a, and a deteriorating uh, energy balance of the, the non-OECD. So that, if, if you like, provides a sort of 10,000 feet overview um, of, of the 2014 data. To get at the stories underpinning those data, you need to get a closer look, you need to get closer to the ground by looking at the individual fuels. So we start um, with, with oil. Oil was at the epicenter of the 2014 energy storm as a number of those overarching forces um, came together. Um, just before we came down over breakfast, Guy was saying, sometimes just seeing the data for, for, for the year as a whole just makes clear what was really going on at the time. And I think that's true uh, in terms of um, the oil market. Um, it, it, and it may just confirm what, to, to many people um, what we already know. The data for, for, for 2014 as a whole make clear that the sharp fall in oil prices last year was largely a supply story. The increase in oil consumption in 2014, if you look at the oil consumption bars, was very close to its, um, its recent historical average. There was nothing particularly exceptional about demand growth in 2014. In contrast, if you look at the su supply charts, uh, the bars to the right, supply, supply growth last year was almost off the charts, with global production increasing by over 2 million barrels a day, more than double its 10-year average. And again, if you look at that non-OPEC, OPEC split, it's clear that that strength was driven by non-OPEC production, which increased by 2.1 million barrels a day in 2014, which is the largest increase we've seen ever on record. So exceptional strength within supply, particularly non-OPEC supply. US production predict predictably set the pace, as we discussed, but that strength wasn't solely restricted to the US, with both Canada and Brazil also enjoying record increases in production with output in both those countries reaching record high levels. In contrast, OPEC production was broadly unchanged, although the share of production across OPEC countries continued to be affected by, dis by supply disruptions in the wake of the Arab Spring. On the demand side, as you can see here, oil consumption grew by 0.8 million barrels a day um, in, 20, in, in, in 2014, with that entirely driven by increases in non-OEC demand, where you see OECD demand uh, falling, particularly within China. The growth in Chinese consumption was a little below its recent historical average, but still accounted for almost half of the increase in global oil demand. As in 2013, the gains in Chinese oil demand were driven by gasoline consumption, supported by the increasing purchasing power of, of Chinese households. In contrast, growth in demand for fuels such as most obviously diesel, which are more exposed to the rebalancing of the Chinese economy away from heavy industry, away from infrastructure spending, they remained very weak by historical standards. That eerie calm that I mentioned earlier that pervaded oil markets during 2011 to 2013 reflected sort of two powerful forces 
operating at the same time, but coincidentally offsetting each other. So on the one hand, you had US tight oil powering away throughout much of that period. But at the same time, Middle East and North African supply was retarded by the events um, uh, of surrounding the Arab Spring. And the net effect of those two uh, effects was that global oil supply increased by an annual average of just over 1 million barrels a day in 2011 to 13, pretty much in line uh, with global consumption. That precarious balancing act came to an abrupt end last year. The exceptional growth in non-OPEC supply far exceeded incremental supply disruptions, which, together with a softening in the growth of oil consumption relative to 2013, led to a growing supply imbalance and a consequent build-up of inventories. As you can see here, OECD um, oil inventories began the year at relatively low levels, but they rose st st steadily through the year, increasing by almost 150 million barrels over 2014 as a whole. And more recent data suggests this stock build continued through the first part of this year, with OECD stocks close to a 10-year high. Not surprisingly, given the, the source of that supply strength, this build-up of stocks was most pronounced here in the US, with US commercial crude stocks at their highest levels since 1930. The price impact of this supply imbalance grew only gradually, so it's a dated Brent averaged $109 in the first half of 2014, which is close to its 2013 average. But as that supply imbalance widened and stocks accumulated, prices began to fall. Dated Brent, shown here on the chart on the right, peaked in the second half of June, and Brent Ford markets, which had generally been backwardated since early 2011, moved into Katango in July. The possibility that OPEC may respond to the growing abundance of supply by reducing production targets probably provided some support to prices through the summer and autumn of last year, with dated Brent drifting down to around $80 by the time of the OPEC meeting in late November. But the decision by OPEC to maintain its production levels and protect its market share broke the market's back. Prices fell sharply with dated Brent ending the year at around $55 and reaching a daily low of $45 in mid-January. One, one key message I take um, from these events is that even in the oil market, prices work. So the high levels of innovation and investment driving the record supply gains which underpin the current surplus were set in motion by a decade of high oil prices. And likewise, the market now appears to be prompt, uh, responding to the prompt of lower oil prices. Data so far this year point to a strengthening of demand growth, and the number of US oil rigs has more than halved since its peak in October last year. The exceptional strength of crude supply spurred a notable, a notable increase in refinery runs, shown here in the chart on the left, which were up over 1 million barrels a day in 2014, more than double their 10-year average. Refinery runs outstripped the increase in product demand as refineries were incentivized to increase their product stocks and so reduce pressure on crude storage. And as, and as this chart makes clear here in terms of those green bars, U.S. refineries led the way, with throughputs increasing by over half a million barrels a day, the largest annual increase since the mid-1980s for U.S. refineries, driven by the strength of U.S. supplies and the consequent discounting of U.S. crude prices. This lengthening in refinery runs was broadly matched by expansion in, in refining capacity, even with material reductions in the OECD, capacity still increased by 1.3 million barrels a day last year. And as you can see on the chart on the right, spare capacity within the refining sector edged to almost 7 million barrels a day above its level in 2005, which we think is sort of a good benchmark for when global utilisation rate was close to its effective maximum. Improvements within the U.S. infrastructure meant that despite the bumper growth in North American supply, 
crude differentials narrowed last year. The average Brent WTI differential fell to around $5.5 in 2014, almost half its level in 2013. And the spread between WTI and West, Western Canadian Select, WCS, narrowed from almost $25 a barrel to less than $20 a barrel in 2014, as you can see, has continued to fall um, through the beginning of, of this year. <coughs> I'm sure we want to come back to ask questions on oil, but that's all I was going to say by, by in terms of the 2014 uh, story on oil. We turn next to, to natural gas. The main story on natural gas was one of exceptionally weak demand. Global gas consumption grew by just 0.4% in 2014, which, with the exception of the financial crisis, is the weakest rate of growth for almost 20 years. In contrast, growth in global gas production was relatively robust, causing um, ca gas prices across the globe to decline through the course of the year, again shown here on the chart on the right. The weakness in global gas consumption in 2014 was driven in large part by, by a fall in EU demand, which, as you can see here, um, as long as the lectern's not in the way, uh, EU demand fell by almost 12% um, um, in, in 2014, which is the largest decline in, in EU demand on record. Uh, what was going on, and I, I personally can't remember this, but it turns out apparently that it was an exceptionally mild winter uh, in Europe uh, last year. I can't remember being an exceptionally mild winter in Europe last year, but it was an exceptionally mild winter uh, in, in Europe last year. Where, and if you look at a measure of heating degree days, which, if you like, is a sort of weighted measure of how many, how many days we actually had to turn on the heating in Europe um, because the weather was very cold, that was at the, one of its record low levels. And this chart here just sort of plots the sensitivity of gas, of gas demand to, temper to temperature variations through time. And, and, and based on that sort of past sensitivity, last year's mild winter would suggest, you know, if you just use that sensitivity as a gauge, probably accounts for the lion's share of the decline in EU demand. So when we're trying to think about why was gas demand so weak, a big part of that was, was Europe. What's going on in Europe? Was there some deep structural thing going on? No, I think the weather was just a little bit warmer during the winter than, than normal, and, and the sensitivities here means that that can account for a lot. And, and, but over and above that, the weakness in European demand was, was, was compounded to a little extent more by gas continuing to lose share in the power sector, particularly and to non-fossil fuels. So there was some structural component going on in terms of um, the, that losing share within, within the um, power sector. But the big story was a, um, uh, was a temperature story. On the supply side, US gas production, which is shown here by these brown bars, US gas production fell by 10 almost 10% um, last year, so which took European production uh, uh, to, to its lowest level since the 1970s. But despite um, that, that fall in production, the extent of the fall in demand meant that gas imports to the EU also declined sharply, with pipeline imports from Russia and elsewhere falling by almost 9%, their largest decline on record. The weakness in, in pipeline gas trade was compounded by the dispute between Russia and Ukraine which resulted in Russia's gas exports to Ukraine being turned off between June and December last year. All told, global gas pipeline trade fell by over 6% in 2014, the largest decline since our trade data began in 1989, causing total gas trade, shown here on the chart on the right, to fall for only the second time on record. So, uh, um, so falling uh, global trade in gas. If you move outside of Europe, gas consumption in, in Asia Pacific was also relatively subdued, with growth slowing to, to 2% in 2014, significantly weaker than its 10-year ten, uh, ten average. You won't be surprised when I say, so what's going on in Asia Pacific? You would know the answer already. The slowing, uh, that slowing can be counted in net terms uh, to a very large extent by Chinese energy demand which saw uh, growth in Chinese gas consumption decline from over 13% in 2013 to just 8.6% uh, last year. So 
slowdown in Chinese gas consumption, but still growing in absolute terms at, at, at very strong rates, but just less strong than seen in previous years. The main exception to this story of global gas weakness was, of course, uh, the US, uh, where, where, uh, where, where gas production in the US grew by over 6%, almost double its 10-year average. And as you can see here on the chart on the right, accounted for almost 80% of the increase in global gas production. All of that growth was due to increases in shale gas, shown here by the green bars, which grew by over 13% last year, with the vast majority of that growth stemming from Marcellus and Utica shale. So again, China, big impact on the demand side. US, big impact on the, um, on the supply side. If we turn next to coal. For many years, the fortunes of coal have been inextricably linked uh, to China. To, to a large extent, China is coal. And this chart, as this chart makes clear, that was true as China industrialized rapidly, causing coal to be the fastest growing fossil fuel over the first 10 years or so of this century. And it was equally true in 2014 as Chinese demand braked sharply and coal became the slowest growing fossil fuel in 2014. For me, when you, when you search, sort of search through um, the, the statistical review, it's sort of thousands of data points in it. I think for me, the single most striking number in the whole of this year's stats review is China's coal consumption, which is estimated to have almost stalled in 2014, growing by just 0.1%. That compares with 2% in 2013 and an average of almost 6% over the past 10 years. So what drove this pause in China's coal consumption? So this chart, this next chart, compares the growth of Chinese coal in 2013 with this pause in 2014 and tries to decompose the factors driving that, that slowdown. And in part, the slowdown is a natural consequence of the generalized slowdown in China's energy demand. As the growth in China's energy demand slowed, the growth in coal consumption naturally slowed with it. And, they, and we think this generalized weakening can account for around two-thirds of the slowdown in China's coal consumption, shown here by the purple bar. Over and above that, coal lost out relative to other fuels in China. Some of that lost ground reflects the fact that coal was disproportionately exposed to the industrial sectors most severely affected by economic rebalancing, those iron, steel, construction, cement sectors we looked at a moment ago. Coal also lost share in the power sector, in part as a result of exceptionally strong growth in Chinese hydropower as new capacity came on stream and high levels of rainfall buoyed utilization rates. So in answer to the question, what drove this pause in China's coal consumption, it looks like a mix of both structural, both structural effects and, and a number of one-off effects. Outside of China, India provided the main source of strength for the global coal market, where both consumption and production grew strongly and posted the largest increments to the global demand and supply of coal. The vast majority of the increased demand for coal in India came from the power sector, enabling total power generation in, in, in India to increase by almost 10% in 2014, <coughs> the strongest rate of increase since 1989. In that context, it's worth remembering that India has one of the largest numbers of people without access to electricity. In a similar vein, Africa also increased its consumption of coal in 2014. We have to be careful about being too sweeping in our judgments about the use of coal. We turn to, to non-fossil fuels. Despite a backdrop of, of slowing energy demand and weak growth in, in, in fossil fuels, non-fossil fuels continue to grow robustly, increasing by 3.7% in 2014, comfortably above their 10-year average. And as you can see here, if you look at the 2014 bar and compare the contribution of non-fossil fuels with fossil fuels, 
non-fossil fuels provided a bigger contribution to global energy growth um, uh, in, in 2014 than fossil fuels. That's the, that's the first time this has happened for over 20 years, other than when the world economy has been in recession. This despite the fact that non-fossil fuels accounted for less than 15% of total primary energy. Global hydropower grew by 2% in 2014, slower than its 10-year average, and nuclear power grew by 1.8%, with the biggest boost provided by South Korea as three nuclear reactors were restarted. For renewable energy, shown here in the orange bar, there's both a half-full and a half-empty story. So the half-full story is that growth in renewables accounted for almost a third of the total increase in primary energy. Okay, I'm just going just to think, I'm bombarding you with numbers. This is a, so renewable energy accounted for almost a third of the total increase in total primary energy in 2014 and provided more than 40% of the increase um, in power generation. So these are really quite significant contributions from non-fossil fuels. Added to that, solar power continued to grow at breakneck speed in 2014. The half-empty story is that although the growth of renewables remained robust in 2014, it was below its 10-year average and, in fact, was its slowest rate of growth since 2003, with this slowdown being driven by wind, which grew at less than half its 10-year rate, in part reflecting less public policy support in both the EU and the US. The half-empty interpretation is reinforced by the fact that, despite this strong growth, renewables accounted for only 3% of primary energy in 2014. So what's going on? Half-empty or half-full? Um, I think you can reconcile the half-full and half-empty stories by the fact that the year-to-year -year growth of renewable energy is relatively insensitive to changes in demand conditions. So as you can see here on, on this chart on the right, Renewables continued to grow relatively robustly in 2014, despite the sharp slowdown in overall energy demand. And as such, renewable energy accounted for a bigger proportion of this smaller increase. Or put differently, and you can see again, you can see it very clearly here by, uh, by looking at the, the, um, the, the, uh, the black blocks, the greater sensitivity of fossil fuels to, to, to market conditions meant that, in effect, they acted as a swing energy source in response to the, slower, um, to the slowdown in energy demand. The final thing I want to touch on, um, I know I'm going on for far too long, is, um, on, is on carbon emissions. The slower growth of energy demand, together with the shift the, in, in the fuel mix, had important implications for the growth of carbon emissions in 2014. In particular, global carbon emissions from energy use, we estimate, rose by just 0.5% in 2014, the slowest rate of growth for over 15 years, other than in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis. So that, and that 0.5% growth last year compares with an average annual growth rate over the past 10 years of 2%. And so what this next chart does, it compares that annual, that average, 10-year average of 2% and compares it with the 5% um, we saw in 0.5% in 2014 and tries to ask the question, you know, what drove this slowdown in 2014 relative to that 10-year average? And we think around a quarter of that slower rate of carbon emissions in 2014 relative to the 10-year average can be contributed to weaker GDP growth. So global GDP on a PPP basis grew by 3.3% in 2014, compared with a 10-year average of 3.7%. And that's shown here by the orange bar. The most important driver, accounting for around half of the slower rate of emissions, was the faster rate of improvement in energy intensity, shown here by the purple bar. That largely reflects the changing structure of the Chinese economy, together with last year's unusually mild winter, causing that one-off uh, fall in heating demand. The remainder of the slower growth reflects the greater than average reduction in carbon intensity associated with the change in fuel mix in 2014, particularly the slowdown in coal and the greater contributions from non-fossil fuels. <coughs> 
If you look at that same comparison, comparing the 10-year average relative to what happened in, in comparing sort of the growth rate in 2014 to the 10-year average, but this time think about it in terms of the contribution from different parts of the world, it is clear that the vast majority of the slowdown in carbon emissions can be attributed to China, reflecting both the sharp slowdown in consumption growth and that shift in the fuel mix away from coal. So the, the one trillion ton question, if you like, is whether these developments in China are likely to persist, so possibly signaling the beginning of a lower trend in emissions growth, or whether they are likely to reverse in the near future. And as we saw earlier, I think there are good reasons for thinking that some of the slowdown in the growth of China's carbon emissions were part of a broader structural rebalancing of the economy that is taking place and is likely to continue. But the extent of the slowdown in 2014 also reflected a number of one-off and erratic factors unlikely to be repeated and which may even be partially um, reversed. So let me uh, wrap up and conclude. Um, following the earlier calm, more normal stormy conditions returned to the world of energy last year. And I, and I wonder if in years to come, we may think, we may look back at 2014 and, and, and wonder whether, it be, whether 2014 will come to be seen as something of a watershed for the energy industry. And that's not because of the near-term volatility, volatility associated with the sharp fall in oil prices and the various adjustments that's triggered. I think to a very large extent, that volatility is, is more a, ret a return to business as usual. But rather because some of the longer-term trends trends which are likely to have a huge bearing on the shape of the energy sector over, com over coming years, came to the fore. The heights scaled by the US shale revolution, sparking a new world order of energy supplies. The rebalancing of the Chinese economy and its implications for global energy demand. And the increasing focus on climate and, and, and environmental issues as we all try to tackle the twin challenges of using energy efficiently and sustainably whilst ensuring it is available and affordable to those that need it most. So lots of interesting issues for future editions of BP Stats Review, which means I can keep coming back to Washington. Thank you. while at the same time uh, crude oil uh, excess capacities remains relatively low. So it's a little bit of a, a, of a uh, conundrum for us fundamentalists. So we have to blame the uh, you know, financial market. So uh, I'm going to uh, 
open up the floor relatively quickly because we promised uh, Spencer he would be out of here on uh, his very busy schedule by 10 o'clock. And I, I hope we want to keep our commitment to all of you as well. So let me open, uh, first of all, uh, on the, I'll, I'll let you answer the question of, do you agree that you, it was more of a supply story on the price side in uh, 2014 than, than it was a demand story? And then uh, when yep. you're, you're finished answering that, I'll, I'll open it up to the uh, audience. Thank you. Uh, y yes, I do think it is. And, and those... Uh, well, I, I've got, I've kept this one on, I can, so, join, I can, I can, uh, can put, okay, let me turn this one on. That, that's going to be a feedback. Um, in terms of just what was exceptional relative to averages, that chart, I think sometimes I really like simple charts, and that chart was very, very clear. Uh, the increase in oil consumption in, in, in 2014 was pretty much in line with what the average seen over the last 10 years. What was off the charts was supply. And I've been in many conversations with macro guys, and they go, God, I think there's a big demand story going on. You think, well, just look at the data. The data tell you what was exceptional, what was truly exceptional uh, in 2013 relative to sort of recent history was a supply story. It was a non-OPEC supply story. It was very much a, a North American uh, story in terms of US, Canada, and, 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 and Brazil. Now, I think the price dynamics were clearly affected by the fact that growth in, in 2013 or demand growth was, was quite strong at sort of 1.3, 1.4 million barrels. So you did have a slowing from year to year, and that affected the dynamics. But if you just look at the big picture, the big picture when, when you look back in history is demand wasn't exceptional, supply truly was exceptional. And so this to me seems very much, uh, it seems very clear. I, I must admit, as li we lived through it, it seemed quite clear, but I think sometimes looking back and looking at the data as a whole makes it crystal clear this was a, to my mind, a, a non-OPEC uh, North American supply story. Thank you, Spencer. And uh, yes, in the third row, we have microphones. Uh, and please identify your self name and affiliation. Anya Grigas, a Truman National Security Fellow. I wanted to, you said that U.S. shale has created a new world order in the global energy markets. To what extent do you think this new world order will unseat Russia from its position of dominance over the European, let's say, energy markets, and along with that, its uh, position of geopolitical influence? Thank you. So the, in terms of Russia's relationship with Europe, that's very much largely a gas story. Um, and the, the issue there at the moment is the EU currently imports around 50% of the gas it consumes. Uh, EU's, um, the, most of those fields in, in Europe are aging, so the production levels are likely to decline over time. So even if you have relatively modest increase in consumption of gas in the EU, on the basis of our energy outlook, uh, we have that sort of import dependency of Europe going up to around three quarters of the gas it consumes in, in the next 20 years. So Europe is d desperately needs to import gas. Uh, Russia sits there with enormous amounts of gas, relatively cheap gas, with plentiful pipelines to, to supply into it. The issue which is most concerning for the EU, and as you can see in, in many of the things they talk about, is the concerns about the dependency of, 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 of that and, and sort of the energy security associated with being so dependent on one single supplier. And I think um, the growth of LNG is, is, is an important sort of part of how this may well play out over the next 20 years. And US gas and the fact that an increasing amounts of the gas production in, in the US will find its way in terms of LNG plays into that. And I think, to my mind, there's two dimensions to this. In part, what you will see as EU's imports demands increase, some of that will be met by uh, LNG rather than just in further increasing amounts of, of Russian gas imports. But also, I think what you'll see is LNG providing like an insurance policy. Um, so when I fill my car up of petrol at the beginning of each week, I go to the petrol station at the end of, of my road. There's a petrol station 
two, two roads further down, I never go to that one. I always go to the one at the end of the road. Now, I know if that one, if something happened to it, I always could go to the one two, two roads further down, but I always go to the one at the end of my road because it's closest. Now, am I dependent on that? No, because I know I can go to the other one. So dependency, you judge not by where you buy your, your fuel from, but your ability to switch if you need to. That's, I think, what dependency depends on, not in terms of where you get it from. So a story here could be is you invest in LNG facilities and the ability, the ability to, to regasify uh, uh, and take in uh, um, LNG within Europe. And in particular, you complete the internal market of pipelines within Europe to make sure all parts of Europe are able to access that gas. And then, to a very large extent, you don't have to use that LNG facility. You can have it there as your insurance policy. You know that it's there if anything happens. Because it's, um, um, because it's there, it means you can carry on enjoying the far cheaper gas from Russia in the confidence that you're not that dependent on it because if anything were to happen, you could shift to the other way. And I think LNG, global LNG supplies, and, and the US becoming sort of one of the three major sort of sources of... of um, uh, of sort of supply strength in terms of LNG, where we see sort of uh, Australia, US, and Africa becoming the three main sources of LNG supplies, plays into that. So I think now, in that sense, our central view is Russia remains the dominant supplier of gas uh, to, to the EU over the next 20 years. But the confidence the EU may have in taking that gas may be enhanced by the fact that it knows the LNG supplies mean it has a sort of plan B if necessary. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Said Bin Sulaim. I am from the West Asian Department at the UAE Foreign Ministry in Abu Dhabi. Um, my question is, you mentioned the gas pipelines and the, and, and the reduction in, in uh, gas pipelines trade due to the Ukrainian crisis. However, political analysts also see that one of the major reasons uh, behind the Syrian crisis and, 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 and Russia's reluctance to, to solve the crisis is due to gas pipelines, it's very strategic location, and they, want, they don't want other foreign powers to have more influence on Syria due to gas pipelines there. What, what do you think about that? So, um So I, I, unfortunately, I, um, well, fortunately for me, I'm, I'm an economist rather than a, 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 a political scientist. So I always find political science things far harder than the economic ones. In terms of economics, what went on in, in 2014 was uh, Russian exports to, to Europe fell sharply, but they fell pretty much in lockstep with demand. Uh, and it, it was demand because it was this mild... Uh, and so the fall in, in Russian exports uh, uh, to, to Europe was about 10%, the fall in EU demand, about 10%. So that was all pretty much similar. There is this dispute. That, that there was obviously a dispute between Russia and Ukraine. Different people have different interpretations of the source of that dispute, but that caused the um, Russia's gas exports to, um, uh, uh, to Ukraine to be turned off for the second half of the year, which had a significant impact on both pipeline trying generally and also Russia's gas exports. Russia's made clear that it's shifting its pipeline uh, process, its, its, its desired pipeline uh, within Europe so it doesn't have to go through uh, Ukraine. But I, think, but I think that, again, that's a function to do with Russia's relationship with Ukraine. I, but but that, that pipeline capacity will still make, make available in terms of bringing gas into, uh, into Europe. And this is the point I was saying earlier. Part of the security dependence on Russia at the moment is there are some parts of Europe, particularly within Southeast Europe, which are very dependent on, on Russian gas pipelines because they have no other source. And this seems to me the importance of completing the internal market for gas pipelines. E e EU uh, officials are very good and quite rightly talk about the importance of single markets and completing markets. They need to complete the market in gas pipelines as well, because that's the best way in which you ensure energy security for across the EU as a whole. Uh, let's try on this side, the third row. And, uh... Thank you. 
uh, Dmitry Chudinovsky, Moscow State University. So no questions about Russia from me. Uh, I've been wondering uh, about if there is any correlation between hydrocarbons prices and uh, <clears throat> investments into renewables and how likely are major oil and gas companies uh, such as BP to invest into renewables in the future? So um, I think there is some evidence that there's a relationship between um, cost of carbon, carbon price, and investment in renewables. Unfortunately, we haven't had many examples of significant and meaningful carbon prices to test uh, this, this out. Um, so two points. Um, it, so, so one is a sort of backward-looking point in terms of, uh, of sort of oil and gas companies' uh, role here. In the past, BP, and it's before my time, so um, uh, others who know BP better can correct me if I'm wrong, we invested in some renewable, different types of renewable projects. And when we invested in different types of renewable projects, the business plan assumed that there would be a carbon price in five or 10 years' time, which made that, that investment viable. We got to five or 10 years' time, and there wasn't a price on carbon, which we expected, and so we were no longer um, we, we were no, so those, those investments were no longer the economic investments we thought because the carbon price that we expected, the price and carbon we expected as in part of the business plan didn't materialise. Sort of the moral for that looking forward is if you set the right carbon price, you sort of unleash market forces and you provide the incentives for everybody to start to behave uh, uh, differently. One part of that, of that sort of uh, unleashing the market forces, it will change, potentially change the fuel mix on, uh, and, and on, on the supply side. And um, entrepreneurs, large oil and gas companies may, in that sense, they will try to, if as soon as you put a price on carbon, then that the, the, you then look for the cheapest way of producing fuel will be the low carbon way. And so that may encourage developments on the supply side. But it's really important here, and I get sort of very frustrated when you, when you hear these debates on climate, that people go, OK, carbon is all on the supply side. At least as much, if not more, is on the demand side here. If you start pricing something, you're, you're rushing it, so people will use uh, energy far more efficiently, and so you'll get far more improvements in those energy intensities that we were talking about. And if we're going to make solutions here, at least as much of the solution, if not more, will come from increasing improvements on demand side. And it's really frustrating that and people always focus immediately just on the supply side, where a lot of the actions here is on, on, the, on the demand side. And you add to that is you start putting those types of prices on, you'll start to get investments in, in all sorts of new technologies, which we don't know um, their, their potential role. So at the moment, the, the very small contribution is being made from, from carbon capture and storage. You provide the right incentive to start getting serious investments in that, then we don't know how far that will take. So I think um, the role of oil and energy companies in, in, within this will be responding to the incentives given to us um, by policymakers by setting those right, right incentives. And as I say, I think the right way of doing that it's by setting, by unleashing market forces. And you unleash market forces not by regulating different parts. You unleash market forces by having a market-based mechanism of, of rationing and a, and a price for carbon. Yes, we'll the third row down here. Uh, Ken Meyer, Gord, World Docs. Uh, you spoke of the United States as a source strength, I believe was your phrase, in natural gas. Are you predicting that the United States will be exporting natural gas in the near future? And if so, when do you think that will start? So, um, yes, our, our central view uh, in the energy outlook is that the resource, the resource base for, for U.S. shale gas and the nature of the productivity and cost improvements we've seen there should support continued strong growth in, in U.S. shale gas of growth of averaging sort of close to 5% a year each year for the next 20 years, so strong supply growth. And part of the economics of why that's possible is because some of that, some of that gas ends up getting exported. If it, if it all had to be uh, consumed within, within America, that would obviously pr price, push the price down more quickly to the point where some of that gas would get uh, trapped. Roughly, and um, we think 
over the next 20 years, in a rough rule of thumb, we thought around the increases in supplies of gas. We had around um, a third of the increase in shale gas eventually being exported, with two-thirds being consumed um, within the U.S. Um, I th my understanding is the first new LNG export facilities, I think, are on stream to be start at the end of this year. I think that's in terms of um, what the, um, the, the, the planned investments are. So it starts uh, by the end of this year. And in generally, in terms of the LNG market, the global LNG market, not just the, the, the US, I think of the global LNG market like a young child. So for those of you who have a young child, this is like a toddler and it's just about to go through a growth spurt. So over the next five years, this market really grows very rapidly over the next five years or so. And to be clear here, this is not based on some fancy economic model or some econometric estimates. This is based on just rather laborious adding up of all the FID projects which we know have been planned, they've been approved, they're in train. What's happening now may push those projects back one or two years or so, but I don't think they get reversed. And as you just look at those projects which have been FID or in train and they come through over the next five years, that leads to a sort of step change in, 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 in the sort of global supplies of LNG over the, over the next five years. And as I said, America's part of that. In addition, two other key parts are, are Australia and sort of the um, East African coast. Yes, sir. Wolfgang Schoenberger, retired BP and independent energy advisor. Just one short question. You talked about Southeast European country, countries being very dependent on Russian Asia. But where does Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean, with its enormous gas uh, reserves, fit into the picture? Why is Noble stuck with Israel and can't go anywhere else? And why uh, uh, is nothing happening there? Um. Pass. Uh, I, uh, I, so I, I don't know. Now. I'm not going to speculate, especially in, in public, on, on, on Cyprus uh, uh, gas. Uh, unless my colleague in the front, which is, no, he's shaking his head either, which must mean it's a very difficult question. So I, I'm sorry, I'm just not expert enough to have a sense about uh, uh, Cyprus uh, gas outlook. Apologies. Uh, Ted Cassinger on the, down here in the fourth, third row. Oh, actually, but you'll get lost in the podcast, though, so people won't uh, hear. Uh, Ted Cassinger, Melvin A. Myers. Uh, you noted that <clears throat> the WTI Brent spread uh, narrowed considerably over the last six to eight months. Um, uh, and in fact, I guess it's in Cantango now. What, how do you see the demand or supply situation changing where that spread is going to widen uh, over the next few months or, and when? Um, So, I, I, so exactly, uh, I mean, who knows? Um, you know, um, we have a BP has a team of several hundred um, people trading that spread, and it has a team of about twelve economists uh, talking about these things. So, um, I'll leave that to the traders about what's going to happen. I think the way I think about that Brent WTI spread is it's got to a level now where I, I think it's unlikely to go much below that rate for a sustainable period of time. Now, you may have odd periods of time where the economics are such that you know, some people may take a loss, uh, a running loss for, on some of the transportation costs for a period of time if they think they're going to unwind and so on. But I think it's unlikely to see a significant shift down in the... Um, in, in, in that, in that, in that, in the sort of the Brent WTI for a sustained period of time, based on my understanding of sort of the two factors driving, which is both the transportation costs and the sort of discount you need on on WTI versus um, some of the um, imported crude. So, five dollars seems to me about uh, a, a sort of naturalish settling point. There may well be spikes which cause it to jump up and, and down. Um, but I, it feels like this is. It feels like to me, if, if somebody, if somebody had to, if, if if I was forced to put a guess about where it would be in two or three years' time, I think my instinct would be, I'm not sure it should be significantly different from around where it is uh, now. Where if you told me when it was up at, you know, if you, only at the beginning of the year, it's quite interesting. Only at the beginning of this year, it was up into sort of ten dollars. Uh, um, now, that $10 thing was to do with 
sort of refinery, so what's happening to refineries both in, 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 the, in the US and in Europe at that time. And, and those sort of near-term spikes may come around, but I think that's sort of, uh, my guess is as we look back through time, we'll see, I wouldn't be surprised over the next few years, it's sort of fluctuating around five with spikes uh, in and around, often to do with sort of uh, turnaround seasons in refineries and so on. I assume that if there were some policy change like crude oil export uh, lifting of that ban, that would would obviously have an impact on uh, on that that spread. I think it it would have potentially have an impact, but you also have to think through that if um, we're shipping WTI to compete in Europe, that's also going to have to discount in terms of those transportation costs. And so if you work that through. It's not obvious to me, just taking plausible numbers, it makes a significant difference to that sort of WTI Brent number. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, here, toward the front, if you raise your so she gets. Then we'll go uh, back to uh, Doug. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Mohammed Bastiki. I work in the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, the cost effectiveness of renewables. Uh, prices have been going down significantly and now reached uh, the Dubai bid, especially the 5.98 cents per kilowatt hour for the 100 megawatt that was uh, built by uh, Saudi based Aqua Power. And also in other developing nations like India, where prices reached 8 US cents per kilowatt hour. Do you think that this will encourage adoption of? Uh, renewables even without a carbon price, or would a carbon price be necessary in order to get the adoption that is needed in order for it to make a higher percentage point? Thank you. Um, so what, what we see already, as you say, is uh, wind, um, particularly in some markets, is, a, is already able to compete um, without any form of subsidies, uh, across, compete against sort of coal and gas in, in the power sector. What we'd expect to see going forward is continuing to move down on those cost curves for, for both wind and particularly uh, for solar, such that over a period of time, um, they, they become increasingly able to increasingly uh, compete without the use of subsidies. And in some sense, I think of there as being a sort of if it's not glass ceiling is not the right word. It's like a fiscal ceiling on, on, on renewables in the sense of if I'm paying a per unit subsidy on renewables, um, when they're relatively small, I don't mind paying that per unit subsidy. But if, if the per unit subsidy doesn't change, as, as these grow bigger and bigger, then it becomes a fiscal issue. And so sort of you need, for the sort of long run growth of renewables, you need to be able to reduce that per unit subsidy in order for that fiscal ceiling not, not to bind. In our energy outlook, we had um, some estimates based from our technology folk on what we thought was going to happen, and you do move down those cost curves of both wind and solar so they can be able to compete against um, coal and gas. We also showed the impact uh, in 2035 if we included a $40 um, price on carbon and, and how that affected the relative prices. And, and obviously what it did is it put up the effective price of of gas and coal fire um, power stations relative to, to that of renewables. And that just, um, particularly for coal, tweaked it such that it, it helped even more. So could it do it without? I mean, it, I, I, it's, it's certainly moving in the right direction and in, 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 in sort of some parts of the world, definitely, yes, and already can do. But um, in, our, in our sort of scenario we looked at in 2035, we had both those improvements and a sort of gradual phasing of, of a carbon price, which pushed it even stronger in the way of allowing wind and solar across increasing parts of the globe to compete um, without the, the need for, for subsidies. Okay, let's group two questions together. Doug Hangel here in the middle and then uh, Ambassador Rich Karzlawich after that. Then we'll answer them after they both. Uh, Doug Hangel at the German Marshall Fund. Could you comment about the role of financial markets and oil prices? This was a big issue a few years back when the oil price was going up, and and a number of studies were done that seemed to indicate that it was not having a major impact. Now we're beginning to hear again, when the oil price comes down, that financial markets were driving this as opposed to supply and exclusively supply and demand. Let's take riches, and then Spencer will answer them consecutively. 
uh, Rich Kosler, it's George Mason University. We're halfway through 2015. Uh, what are you going to be looking for as you look ahead to writing your statistical review for next year in terms of the major changes? OPEC has obviously announced it's not going to change its production outlook. Where, where do you see the deltas coming that may change your story for next year? Hey, that's good. I was really enjoying the fact that we've managed to produce this year's statistical review. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, f financial markets, so as, as Guy said, um, I I'm a relatively newcomer. I, I, can, I, can we call it the oil family rather than the uh, energy, energy family? I'm a relatively newcomer uh, to the energy family, but, and I spent 25 years in, in central banking, uh, a big chunk of that at the Bank of England. And for many, many years, I've been told over and again that, that different types of markets were being driven by financial factors, and it was speculators causing market prices to move away from fundamentals. There's been many, many studies, and I've never seen one that has been able to convincingly demonstrate to me that they cause prices to move away from fundamentals for long periods of time. Now, can I say, say if Brent jumped down by $2 tomorrow or WTI spiked up, could that be caused by financial factors? Sure. I think near-term volatility can clearly be driven by, by financial flows. But why, why did oil prices fall from a sort of $100 um, we saw in, in, uh, in sort of the first half of sort of 2013 and the first beginning of 2014 to, to sort of $50, $60? It's because, you know, the risk is saying the obvious, something like a million and a half barrels of oil being, being produced each day and somebody had to buy a million and a half barrels of oil. I can't even comprehend what a million and a half barrels of oil looked like. They had to, they had to stump up their capital, buy it, put, hold up that storage, put that, um, pay for the storage, tie up their capital, and hold it for a period of time, knowing that nobody would want to buy it for some conceivable period of time. I'm only going to do that if I think I can do that, sell it at some point in the future for a higher price. It's not surprising to me that prices fell. Um, in, in, in sort of physical markets, it seems to me quite natural. With physical markets with very steep demand and supply curves, it seems quite natural to me you'll get quite significant price volatility. And I don't think you need to search for theories of financial speculation to, to, um, to explain that. Um, uh, Richard's question on, on major change in the deltas. I think it's, so I think, well, obviously a fascinating issue is just what will happen to the US shale in terms of low prices. But I, I think I, what I, the, the issue there, I think, would be important that don't finish the story when we write the 2015 review, but to also do the 2016 and 2017 review. The way I'm thinking about shale is, if you like, if you think, you know, we all went to school, we were taught that the supply curve for oil was very steep. It wasn't very sensitive to price, and it wasn't very sensitive to price because big oil companies like BP would, would take several years, sink in huge amounts of money doing a platform in the middle of the ocean somewhere, drilling a, drilling a hole, and once that well had been drilled and oil has been extracted, it wasn't going to turn it off, even if the price of oil dropped by 10 or 20%. And so supply was relatively insensitive over any short period of time. Shale completely changed that. You have to, it's like a manufacturing investment. You have to keep on investing to, um, to produce. And as a result of which, you've introduced sort of, to my mind, a kink in the supply curve. There's, in terms of that very steep supply curve, in the middle of that supply curve, there's a kink in that supply curve, which is a, a piece of supply which is far more price sensitive. Now, if the point of saying don't stop the story at the end of 2015, I could quite imagine we've seen rigs fall off very sharply um, this year, and we're starting to see production at least flatten out, if not starting to, 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 to fall off a little bit. And so the, I guess my point would be there is don't then say, oh, there, there it is, that's the death of the shale industry. I think that's, that's one part of it. And then, then as prices come back up, then let's see what happens in 2016 and 2017. When I was a child in England, I'm not sure if you had them here, in England there was something called weebles. And a weeble was a toy which you used to push, and because it had a weighted bottom, you pushed it down and it bounced up again. And you could push it down for a bit and it would bounce up again. And it'd be very, it was very resilient. You kept pushing it down, down. And this is how I think of the US shell industry. It will, sure, as prices fall, it will come off. And as it comes off, that will act to dampen the extent to which prices need to fall. But likewise, um, as prices come back up, 
it will come back up more quickly, and that will then dampen the price to the extent to which prices will need to rise. Other things equal. Now, OPEC can over, obviously override all of that, but in terms of just the pure supply curve, that's how I think. So I think understanding this will be fascinating. Just, and, you know, just how resilient is it? How quickly can it come off and go back, I think, will be fascinating. I think the other one, and so it's maybe a bit boring, but this was sort of my point, is I think, I, you know, I guess my thesis is some of these big trends are the ones which will persist for a long period of time. So it'll be updating those trends. I think the other one was how much of what we saw in China is, is erratic and how much of it is, uh, is, is, is sort of signal and telling us about it. When I, I was in China, and everybody here, I'm sure, travels to China a lot. I was in China a month or so ago. I was really struck by the commitment there by sort of, you know, people not at sort of very senior levels, but sort of working level people, the commitment to sort of transform their energy system to transfer their mix of energy and transform some of these in the sort of their, their their energy consumption and so just understanding so updating year by year in terms of that sort of getting a better sense about what's going on in china as well i think would also be very important and i guess the third thing sorry uh, is it's a point that was made yesterday in london when thinking about the response to our oil prices it's really easy to think about if you like the five million barrels associated with shale uh, in terms of non-OPEC supply and, and, and missing the 45 million barrels in terms of outside of US shale. So what we have seen is companies, you know, large companies all announced uh, capex cuts. If you add up all the announcements, you can get to reductions in capital expenditure by major oil and gas companies of sort of 120, 130 billion dollars uh, of announcements. How will that start to play out in non-OPEC supply? Um, um, now, again, I think it will be too early to see in terms of the 2015 data, but trying to start to learn about that, I think, will be another key thing over the sort of next couple of years. Okay, well, we have time for one more question. If there, if there have you, and if you found this guy, whenever you ask one last question, you nearly always never get one, do you? So. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mike always okay. wants to prove me <laughs> exception. So, Mike. All right. I'm Mike Keynes with the Logistics Management Institute. I'd, I'd really like you to elaborate a little more on that China question. I mean, the number was very striking on the coal the reduction in the coal consumption increase uh, from year to year. And you said uh, a lot of this was due to structural change in the economy, but some of it was due to one-off factors uh, which might not be repeated and some of which might be reversed. So I'd like you to elaborate a little on that and also on the extent to which the Chinese are focused on local air pollution problems and how that might play in to what will happen to their coal consumption. Thank yeah. you. Um, so the, the erratic factors I point to are sort of two or threefold. So one is, remember, in terms of that coal story, there's a bit of a sort of chasing the tail of a story here. Why did coal consumption slow? To a two-thirds of it looked like because energy consumption slowed. So you then have to say, well, why did energy consumption slow? And so there, some of that does look like there's this trend, this movement essentially away from the industrial sector towards the service sector. But then I'd say, but look at what's happening to some of those growth rates. So, you know, iron, steel, cement, growth rates are 1% or 2%. Is that really conceivable? Can that continue year after year if the economy keeps growing at 7.5% or 7s and 6% and they start to um, move out in terms of their urbanization into the interior of, of China? I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, so... Perhaps some of those things, what, you know, grow, annual growth rates can, can sort of jump around for all sorts of reasons. So that, I'd say, just some of those numbers look quite extreme. And as I said, though, some of those improvements in energy intensity will be harder to achieve as you start to come down to sort of the industrialised country's norm. So I point there. Within the um, outside of that, in terms of coal losing um, share within, within the fuel mix, so the other components, so not the generalised slowdown, a big chunk of what happened in the power sector was this extraordinary growth in hydropower. Um, and the numbers here are, are quite chunky. Um, and so what happened in hydropower is sort of the perfect storm came along is quite a significant amount of capacity came on stream and you had high rainfalls boosting utilisation rates. I don't think you'll get that sort of growth in hydropower this year, and, and, in, and in, conceivably, you may even get some reduction in hydropower if you don't get such plentiful rain supplies. So that's sort of another erratic factor. So I guess my instinct would be we are seeing a slow in trend in, in Chinese energy demand. 
Um, um, but we're going to have, that will be a wiggly line. And I think my hunch is when we look back over four or five years, this may be a particular one where, where it spiked down low in 2014. It may go the other way. I think environmental concerns really do matter and sort of air quality do matter. And part of another reason why coal lost share in the power sector, and it's not, I don't think the numbers are as big, but it's sort of indicative of your question, is some um, sort of aging power sector, uh, um, coal-fired power stations, particularly close to very sensitive urban areas were closed down. And so you can, this is not a generalized policy. This was, there are some particular power sectors, which are power stations, which are causing air pollution very close to sort of deep pockets of, of, of urban population. And you saw those close, and that was part of that, that, that loss of, of, of power there. And, you know, again, uh, anybody's been to China recently, you're very aware that that local air pollution uh, uh, issue is a very significant political issue for, for the Chinese and is one of the drivers which is driving some of this movement away from coal into alternative fuels. Thank you and uh, thank the audience uh, for coming today and your excellent questions and please join me in uh, thanking Spencer Dale.